Good morning and welcome to this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. We have one item on our agenda this morning and that is a decisional meeting on petition HP 15-1 requesting rulemaking on certain products containing organohalogen flame retardants. This morning we have three staff members at the table for any questions that the commissioners have, uh, have in this opening round. We have Dr. Alice Thaler, Associate Executive Director of Health Sciences, welcome. Dr. Christina Hadalid, toxicologist, and Ms. Patricia Pollitzer from the Office of Ge uh, General Counsel. Thank you all very much for being here this morning. We will begin with questions for the staff, uh, and each commissioner will have five minutes for questions, and we can go multiple rounds if necessary. Following the questions for the staff, we will turn to consideration of the petition. So with that, I will begin some questions for our staff this morning. One of uh, the questions I have <clears throat> is with regards to other federal agencies um, banning classes of chemicals. Can any of you, uh, I guess I'll start with Dr. Hadley, can you uh, share any information you have on that, whether or not you have knowledge of other agencies that have done that. Thank you, Chairman. I, I, I'm not an expert on, on everything that other agencies do. I'm familiar through my own work of, of certain um, regulatory actions, one uh, of a group of chemicals, it's asbestos, which we also work on. Asbestos is not a sp single specific chemical, it's a group of mostly related minerals with some um, common physical and chemical um, characteristics and some common health effects. And they've been sort of considered as a group. So EPA um, had a banning action some time ago, which affects a few products. Um, and another uh, group, um, FDA, has action on the perfluoroalkyl alcohol subst substances. Again, those are um, very similar chemically, even though it's a a number of different substances in that group, but when you look at the chemical structure and and, and the, the the features of the chemistry of the compounds, they're quite similar. Thank you. And would you uh, make any kind of an analogy? Is the situation with our halogens? Can you say that they are similar as well as much as what the FDA attempted to to uh, regulate? The, the staff pointed out in the in the briefing package that. Chemically, there are a number of subclasses of, for the for the flame retardants, and um, they're in, in groups of, of chemicals such as the brominated phthalates or benzoates or the cyclic aliphatic bromides or the uh, diphenyl ethers. So those are, are descriptors of, of chemical classes, and then there's the larger group of, of a functional, um, which is the flame retardants, and, and then of course they do have the commonality of having um, at least one halogen atom. Um, on that molecule. Thank you. Do you know, um, with with regards to the EPA and asbestos, how that ended? Most of the banning action was overturned. Um, as I recall, there were a number of, of reasons for that, and uh, a few of the products that were included are banned, um, paper products and, and some similar asbestos-containing materials. Thank you. Um, in looking uh, through some of the testimony that was provided at the public hearing last week, uh, Dr. Uh, Osimitz testified, uh, and that's, this was the second time he was here before the commission, and he talked about in his key points the need to examine flame retardants as individual chemicals and not group them under the assumption that they have identical toxicological and environmental fate properties. Would you uh, c comment on that? I think we expressed in the package that the, we do have a need to, to know um, some information about the chemicals that we're considering, including their toxicology and then the, the exposure and risk from the products that they're used in and, and, and how we think about uh, regulating under the FHSA. So yes, we would, we would want to know some information about the, the various substances we're talking about. Thank you. Uh, one other uh, point that uh, Dr. Arsenitz raised was um, considering the, exp uh, the uh, potential exposure and risk before declaring the item hazardous. 
Uh, he mentions that under FHSA, the substance be both toxic as well been shown to show the potential to cause substantial personal injury. Do you think that in this current, uh, in this package, we're to the point where we have that much knowledge about these organohalogens? I think that we, we have knowledge about the uh, toxicology of the substances. We have some information about where exposures could be occurring. We've not assessed specifically from these products and that pathway between the product and the, and the consumers. Thank you. My time is about to expire, so I will call on Commissioner Edler. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I don't have uh, many questions, maybe one, uh, because I went out and met with staff, uh, and I want to thank you again for sitting and going with me through my six pages of questions uh, and answering them fully. I guess the one question I would ask is, uh, I assume you heard Dr. Birnbaum's testimony. Uh, she is the director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Science, and she said that of the uh, numerous OFRs she studied, uh, she doesn't know of one that has not been shown to cause potential health problems. That's of those where we actually have sufficient data. Is that a statement that you would agree with? The, the toxicology of, of many of the substances is, is, has been studied and, and in many cases well characterized and, and certainly we see um, that there are toxic effects in, in, in largely in animal models or in other, other ways of looking at toxicology. But yes, we know something about the, the toxicity and, and that's why we would want to do further work uh, such as exposure and risk assessment. No further questions. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson. I just want to thank staff for this um, package and for your hard work on this, and I fully appreciate that you weren't able to put into this what you would into rulemaking, um, but rather what we do with respect to petition. Um, and I just want to thank you, but I have no questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Kay. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Commissioner. Commissioner I, thank you, Chairman. I don't have any questions either. Thank you. I have one, uh, a couple of additional questions for Dr. Hadlett. Um, in my, in, in the previous conversation we had, and unfortunately Dr. Babich isn't here today, but in our ops plan there is um, work that has been um, designated to be done by EXHR with regards to exposure and toxic chemicals in children's products. And in our conversation, you mentioned to me that there was a plan in place to address organohalogens that Dr. Babbage had worked on. I'm not sure you're comfortable, and certainly I don't want to make you uncomfortable, but if that's something you could speak to this morning that staff is, has begun and is addressing this issue. We've had a number of, of actions over the last many years trying to um, increase our knowledge and the toxicity of many of these compounds and to, to look in the market and, and start to think about exposure and, and then doing risk assessments. What, what this work would be is to, um, to, to follow on that and, and try to answer some of these questions and, and through, through exposure and risk assessment. Thank you. Um, one other thing that Dr. Asimitz, uh points out in his um, testimony, and I'd be interested to hear you comment on this. He says that the presence of an OFR, an organohalogen flame retardant, in an article does not thereby make the item a hazardous uh, substance. Can you comment on that? In, in my experience of, of, of working under the FHSA and, and, and uh, dealing with hazardous substances, it's that's what we would look at. That's what the consumer is, is purchasing and, and interacting with. And, and we look at how the exposures to whatever substances are in that. And of course, that's on the chemical side. There are other, there are other hazards. Um, and, and so it, that's, that's how I have always thought about it. It's, it's, it's not that the chemical might be present. It's what then will the consumer's ex exposure and experience be with, with that chemical. 
Thank you. And just one last question, uh, if you could, Dr. Hedlund. With regards to the thousands of occurring, naturally occurring organohalogens, can you speak to how they might be in the body and there's, they're naturally occurring? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have that knowledge at, the, at my fingertips. Thank you. I do not have any additional questions. Commissioner Adler? Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, although I was delighted to have uh, Dr. Osmitz testify, uh, I would note that he is a paid consultant for the American Chemistry Council, and he was the only uh, toxicologist that I heard who was taking the position that he did. What we had, uh, by contrast, was uh, a collection of government experts and some of the top uh, state-of-the-art cutting-edge uh, academic researchers in toxicology who had a different perspective on the event, I mean on the issue. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson? I just have a quick question. Um, Dr. Birnbaum talked about the real-life use of is not a single chemical but a, but a compound of chemicals. I assume you agree with that. If you're talking about how, how manufacturers approach what they're doing, right. th there certainly can be a mixture of, of substances. And, and we, there are some tools we have in toxicology and risk assessment to think about as a compound. exposures and risk uh, to mixtures. OK, thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Kay? No, thank Commissioner you. Commissioner Mohorovic? Oh. Okay. Having heard no further questions, staff is excused from the table, and we do appreciate your presence here today. Thank you. We are now going to consider any amendments or emotions. Motions. Does anyone have any amendments or emotions this morning? Uh, Madam Chairman, thank you. I have two motions, which I believe have been distributed. Am I correct? They're being distributed, but that you have had copies. Everyone have a copy of the motion. Commissioner Adler, I will recognize you for your motion and ask you to describe it uh, for up to three minutes. And then at the conclusion of that, I will ask for a second to your motion. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Uh, my first motion is to have the commission vote to grant the petition submitted to the commission on June 30th, 2015 by a coalition of public health groups and consumer groups to ban the use of additive non-polymeric organohalogen flame retardants as a class with respect to four specific product categories. In the interest of brevity, I'm just going to refer to the uh, organohalogen flame retardants as OFRs. The specific product categories identified in the petition are durable infant or toddler products, children's toys, child care articles, or other children's products, upholstered furniture sold for use in residences, mattresses and mattress pads, and plastic casings surrounding electronics. My motion would have the Commission direct staff to convene a chronic hazard advisory panel pursuant to the procedures set forth in Section 28 of the Consumer Product Safety Act to assess the risk to consumer health and safety of OFRs as a class of chemicals and have the CHAP report its findings to the Commission. My motion specifically directs the CHAP to review all relevant data, including the most recent, best available, peer-reviewed scientific studies, and where limited or no data are available to use any generally accepted scientific methodology to fill in the data gaps as appropriate. In addition, as part of its assessment, the CHAP should consider that consumers are exposed not just to a single OFR, but rather to mixtures of chemicals. In making this motion, I'm well aware that staff recommended we deny the petition. So let me address what I perceive to be the staff's main objections and explain why I came out differently. As a starting point, uh, I note that a large part of the staff's recommendation rests on their misgivings about treating OFRs as a broad class of chemicals given uh, their differing levels of toxicity and the differing levels of exposure that consumers are subject to. I grant staff's point about the differing levels of toxicity, but what I've not heard from staff nor from any of the witnesses are, are at our hearings is credible evidence demonstrating that there are any, and I use quotes, safe organohalogen flame retardants. There are certainly a number of OFRs where we have no studies to provide us with proof of harm, but years of experience confirm every time we get sufficient data to evaluate the risk of any specific OFR, we always find it to be so toxic that we start to remove it from our products. In other words, the more evidence that accumulates, the stronger we see the case against the use of these chemicals. 
The fact is they carry a set of common characteristics found in every member of the family, and those characteristics turn out to be unreasonably hazardous. I see no indication that we will ever find results to the contrary. Uh, moreover, I believe it to be a useless exercise to determine precisely the exposure of consumers to each and every OFR in the environment, given their ubiquitous nature and their existence in mixtures of things like household dust. Again, I note that Dr. Birnbaum and almost all the other witnesses stressed the impossibility of addressing OFR risks other than as a class. There are simply too many of these chemicals in the market and entering the market to regulate them one by one. I repeat, it defies common sense to do a one by one approach given the reality that consumers, especially children, encounter OFRs as mixtures, not as individual uh, chemicals. Having listened carefully to the testimony of the witnesses at last week's hearing, and having read and reread the law, I'm convinced that the FHSA permits us to use scientifically approved methods of analyzing known data to fill in any data gaps regarding OFR risks. The FHSA was never meant to be a straitjacket, barring us from adequately protecting the public. To the contrary, the courts remind us again and again to read public health statutes broadly to effect their, effectuate their safety goals. And that's my motion. Thank you, Commissioner Adler. Do we have a second? Second. second. Commissioners will ask questions of Commissioner Adler, and then we will come back to him at the end, uh, unless a commissioner wants to yield their time for answers. Uh, each commissioner will have five minutes per round, and we can have multiple rounds if needed. Um, commissioner Adler, I would, um, I'd like to ask you whether or not you would be willing to defer the vote today to see whether or not we could uh, try to develop a consensus among the commissioners. I also would ask you to consider whether or not uh, I, would be, uh, I would be willing to support a CHAP if there was a willingness to defer the petition. I also want to talk a little bit about and ask you uh, some questions regarding whether or not uh, granting the petition and convening a CHAP is um, is, is a prudent way to go, uh, that whether or not you would consider granting the petition but then having it go back to staff and have staff consider whether or not um, we should proceed with any rulemaking. Uh, I also want to know whether or not if this petition is granted, what your intentions are with regards to rulemaking. You're talking about convening a CHAP and what would your direction to staff be with regards to rulemaking? Um, and at this point, that's all I have. Commissioner Robinson? Are, are you going to answer? Uh, what do we I do? I believe we just present the, the questions and then he'll answer. I, I'm delighted to respond to uh, the, the chairman's uh, concerns and questions. Uh, and let me just say that uh, we have been involved uh, with you and your office and with Commissioner Mohorovic and with all the commissioners uh, in round the clock almost negotiations about whether we could come up with a common agreement that uh, everybody buys into. Uh, I'm convinced that we have made great progress, but I'm also convinced that we've reached a point where uh, an immediate resolution to the various disagreements that we have uh, would be that easy. And so I do think that there is, and please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, there is a solid com consensus among the commissioners that OFRs really do pre present a very serious risk risk of toxicity to the vast majority of consumers in the public. We, we heard testimony to the fact that uh, some 90 percent plus of us have carry off hours in our bodies and in particular uh, there's a greater concern for children and for people in low income communities. So uh, I apologize for interrupting but we've exceeded my five minutes. Oh so I, it's, I beg it's your pardon. No, I was just getting wound opportunity up. Opportunity to ask questions. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. I, I want to thank Commissioner Adler for making this motion and I intend to support it and I agree that we should grant the petition. After sitting through the hearing in 2015 as well as last week's hearing and reviewing over 200 comments we've received on this issue, I'm absolutely confident that we have a solid basis for beginning um, the process of rulemaking and I think the CHAP is the way to do this. Um, I'd like to note that I was influenced in this vote to grant the petition and appoint a, appoint a CHAP not only by the 
the many, many people who submitted comments and also almost 40 witnesses who testified in favor of the petition. But I'm also influenced by the fact that the only parties from whom we've heard who oppose granting this petition, first of all, represent those with a financial interest in continuing to have these um, potentially toxic, and some of them definitively toxic, chemicals in our environment. And I'm also influenced by the fact that several of the presentations by those who oppose the petition, both at the hearings and in meetings held at the office, were very much not transparent, which was very, very troubling to me. There were presentations concerning um, flame retardants that were added, that were not additive, but rather bonded, which is completely irrelevant to this petition, that were polymers instead of non-polymeric, again, completely irrelevant to this petition, and that were used inside electronics, which is irrelevant to this petition. So I was strongly influenced that we're going the right direction to get a chap to really look at this by not only those who testified in favor of the petition, but those who are against. I think it's absolutely critical that we have a qualified group of scientists look at this and make their recommendations. At the beginning of the hearing, I would like to say something about staff on this. At the beginning of the OFR hearing last week, Chairwoman Burkle noted accurately that staff spent limited time and resources because that's what we do when we're reviewing petitions. We're not starting the rulemaking process, which is a, is a much more um, resource-intense um, process, but rather whether we should grant the petition. Um, and we just don't allocate the same amount of time and effort to a petition. Um, so staff was quite candid in noting that in many areas they did not have enough information or alluded to the amount of time and resources um, it would take to review all of the available scientific research and therefore arrived at their recommendation based on limited information. And I appreciate that staff had um, lim th that limited information in making their recommendation. And moreover, I appreciate the fact that our limited budget is shrinking even more given this administration. As a result, CPSC staff will have less time and fewer resources to protect consumers in such endeavors as studying these OFRs. Um, so I think that it is very important that we convene a CHAP. And I, say, I said during the hearing last week there are two key issues through which we need to work in connection with this petition. The first is determining whether OFRs as a class may be, may be toxic, with that being the operative word under our statute, and determine whether exposure to this class of OFRs in the product categories in the petition may lead to hazardous and toxic health effects. And those um, products have been spelled out by Commissioner Adler. The CHAP is the perfect mechanism to ensure that we have the most rigorous and scientific analysis of these issues. And the science is something that this agency, I hope, will not reject as some of our other agencies have. And although it will take time to go through this process, I believe that, believe that it will provide the CPSC with robust findings on which we will base our future rulemaking. And I further believe that the CHAP will be the most efficient and effective way to use CPSC resources and leverage expertise in the scientific community. And let me also add that I can think of no reason whatsoever to defer the vote on this. Um, we have spent an enormous amount of effort on this with two um, hearings and with some of the most preeminent toxicologists in the country telling us that we should be examining this. And I think it's time to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Robinson. Commissioner Kay. Uh, first, Commissioner Rather, I didn't know. I will yield to you if there were further answers you wanted to provide to Chairman Burkle. Well, as I say, I was just getting started, so thank you for that, and I do appreciate it. Um, I think that, uh, as I was saying, I think that there is a reasonable consensus among all the commissioners about the toxicity and the hazards associated with OFRs. Uh, what to do about that is a, a serious question for us, but uh, at this point, I think we have more than sufficient evidence to move ahead to grant the petition uh, and to designate a CHAP. Um, there are some other issues on chemicals in consumer products that my colleagues have raised, and I must say I am in uh, sympathy with those concerns. Uh, and it is my considered and strong hope that by the time we get to the op plan in about a month, that we will be able to reach consensus on some of the other issues that uh, my colleagues have raised. 
Uh, I do think the op plan is the appropriate place to address some of these other issues that I would uh, call ancillary. With respect to the hazards of OFRs, I think we have all that we need to know to make a decision today. Thank you for that. And that was helpful for me as well. The, the motion is long overdue in my mind. And so I commend you for all the work that you and your office have put into this to get it to where it is today. I'm particularly interested in how, what your interpretation is of your language toward the end in terms of the, how the commission, you propose that the commission notes uh, certain authorities that the commission has. In your mind, can you just expand a little bit on that as to how specific the direction is and, and is it mere in a mere opinion by the commission that can be disregarded or is it more of a legal direction a legal interpretation and direction in your mind well this is one where i do agree with uh, commissioner robinson's assessment of the federal hazardous substances act i think that the federal hazardous substances act gives us a clear uh, map as to what action ought to be taken in order to regulate and if you'll note uh, i've got two motions before the com uh, commission, one of which is to take immediate action with respect to guidance and advice to the public, and the other is to do, as again, as Commissioner Robinson was saying, the more difficult approach of rulemaking, which unfortunately under our statutes is uh, full of obstacles and findings and procedures that I think are irrelevant and unnecessary, but it, they're things that we must do, but I think the direction to us is very, very clear and very precise. And so if, for instance, if this were to pass and a package came up and talked about um, not going ahead as a class or doing a quanti quantitative risk assessment, do you believe that the, that type of work is included in this direction or do you feel that that might be outside of the scope? I think it's important to clarify uh, what the scope is that you're proposing so well, that we don't end up spending time in a back and forth later that may that might be avoided now well uh, first of all with respect to quantification there's no requirement in the uh, federal hazardous substances act that we quantify the risk uh, again uh, we are supposed to look to see whether it may present a serious uh, risk to the public health and whether it has the capacity to do so with respect to uh, moving ahead uh, individual by individual chemical, that is outside the scope of my motion. Uh, that is a sure way to kill any approach to uh, protecting the public is to go through uh, individual chemical by individual chemical. I guarantee if we were to do that, a century from now, we would still be marching our way through organohalogens. Thank you for that. No further questions at this time. Thank you, Commissioner Kay. Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Commissioner Adler, I'm going to appeal to you as a colleague. Um, I, I really hope that you will reconsider the chairman's offer in asking you to put off uh, a final decision on this matter because we are so close to forging a meaningful, bipartisan consensus position where the agency's direction will be clearly understood for all stakeholders who have spent hours and I would probably guess millions of dollars in researching this matter to to side with those who want to be strident and politicize this issue and be completely partisan I don't deny you have the votes you can push this through you can use your three votes you will politicize this issue and you will jeopardize the long-term ramifications of any meaningful direct um, uh, agency action on this matter. There is no arbitrary timeline that suggests that we have to move on this action right now. Uh, I appreciate the hours around the clock effort that you have made. You recognize that, um, that I also am right fully at the table with open negotiation, not taking a, a partisan, you know, completely conservative right-wing opinion on this, but instead trying to forge and seek that consensus. You have described yourself as a serial compromiser. I want you to be that serial compromiser. I don't want you to compromise your position, but I want you to think about the long-term long implications of politicizing this issue. If we politicize this issue and make it about the political dynamic which exists at the agency right now, 
where it takes a year for our agency to realize in a majority capacity the results of the election. Uh, Commissioner Robinson's term is due to expire, I believe, in a uh, little over than a month, maybe a month and two days. Um, the actions of the commission at this point in time will be clearly understood by everybody. Uh, you have the opportunity right now to depoliticize this. And as a member of the commission who has crossed over the aisle, I would suggest maybe uh, beating that path more than, more than others over the, at least the three years that I've been on it. Um, it is uh, somewhat of a source of pride, and it's a source of accomplishment, and it's a, it's, it gives me a pride of independence. And there is no reason uh, to take this issue and, and um, apply it to power politics at this point in time. You can. You might. I hope you don't. Um, but you have the ability to depoliticize this issue. And I would suggest that for the constituencies who feel so strongly about it, as we've seen from two sets of all-day hearings, they would not want to see this general issue reduced to a political football that right now will be kicked in one direction, and then with the change of new nominees and confirmation will be kicked back in the other direction. Instead, we can move forward in a bipartisan way and give clearer direction. Uh, I think that would be in the best interest to the public. Uh, I, too, could be convinced of supporting a CHAP to deploy independent scientists uh, not to suggest that what we've received before is not independent, but it's certainly a process. And as I've uh, enjoyed remarking, the uh, history of liberty has largely been the history of the observance of procedural safeguards. Uh, a CHAP would have all of those safeguards to give uh, the public and to give the decision makers uh, the ability to be able to have actionable information. And uh, I just implore that you depoliticize this matter uh, consider, let's get, back to the, let's get back to the negotiating table. There's no reason not to. There's enough partisanship in Washington, D.C., and you personally have the ability to be able to depoliticize this, uh, this particular matter, which is so important, and I hope you take that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Adler, you may respond. Thank you very much, uh, and I just want to... I apologize for only leaving you 30 seconds in response outside of your five minutes later. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I really appreciate the uh, concern, and I do want to say that I can consider you to be a truly esteemed colleague, and I agree with you. Uh, you more than uh, most have crossed the line in the pursuit of the merits of issues. You have done your best uh, not to politicize issues. Uh, I'd like to believe that I do as well, and you're right. I am proud to be a compromiser. I think that's the only way to make government function. Uh, I worked for a congressman, Henry Waxman, who was also a serial compromiser, and I think he was one of the most successful members of Congress in history. Um, and so I don't want the dialogue to cease, um, and my my only reason for pursuing this now is that I think we've got enough clarity about the science and about the issues to proceed, but as I, uh, and I will pledge openly and publicly that the particular issues that you and the chairman have raised are issues w that resonate with me. Um, I don't think we could easily resolve them automatically uh, today or even within the next week because some of these are pretty serious technical issues. But I repeat my pledge uh, to sit down with you and try my best by the time we get to the op plan, which is a month away, to work out whatever additional uh, measures we can work out. And at, le at least knowing the two of us and also knowing the chairman and my colleagues, I suspect we could. Um, but there, the, the one uh, issue that is really uh, a, a challenge for me is one that presents some very serious technical issues, and that's why I also want the opportunity to go out and meet with staff. It is not uh, an issue with respect to organohalogens in the four product categories. It's a, it's a broader issue, and it is one that, uh, and I want to commend you and the chair for bringing the issue up, uh, but it is one that I think needs a, just a little bit more uh, addressing of the technical issues. So again, thank you. You will uh, have 
done a brilliant job of guilt tripping me and uh, I commend you for it and I will tell you it affects me it really does and it is because I hold you in such esteem so uh, while I will not specifically agree to your request I, I just want you to know I take it to heart and I hope that we can uh, very soon work out agreement on the issues that still separate us Thank you. Uh, we, I have uh, additional questions. What we will do at this, uh, this point is to complete any rounds of questions we have on this motion. Then we will take a short recess to de determine some procedural uh, issues, and then we'll re resume the hearing. Um, with regards to my question, so, and I'm not sure I heard it, um, even though you were on your roll there. With regards to rulemaking, uh, this, this motion before us says grant the petition to initiate rulemaking. Now, so we will convene a CHAP and we will uh, direct staff to, to begin rulemaking on organic halogens. And that will be your direction in the, in which ops plan are we talking about? Well, it would be the immediate ops plan, but the, the, I understand this would be a multi-year uh, project. I think there's no question about that. And uh, one of the things that I tried to do in the motion was not uh, burden staff with an almost insurmountable set of uh, measures that they have to proceed with. So at least my notion, but I, we're leaving this to the discretion of the staff and the executive director, my notion is that much of the work that the staff would be doing in terms of grant, work on granting the petition would be uh, organizing the CHAP and working to manage the CHAP and support the CHAP. Uh, and in addition, obviously, they do continuing research and development, but the main task at hand, it seems to me, would be the CHAP. And so no rulemaking. You're considering the activities of the EXHR and the staff there would be to push forward the concept of the CHAP? Well, the CHAP ultimately, as far as I'm concerned, is going to be in support of rulemaking, but we are granting the petition. We are saying on the merits before us today, we have sufficient uh, information and evidence to proceed to uh, address this by way of rulemaking. So one of my questions is, because you just made the comment to uh, Commissioner Mohorovic, that we have enough clarity pr to proceed. So why the CHAP? Why, why are we then saying, well, maybe we don't have enough clarity to proceed? It seems to me that we don't have enough. Our, our staff, our experts that we rely on for information said to us, there are data gaps. We cannot m extrapolate across this very broad, unwieldy uh, group of chemicals that they are all dangerous. So it seems to me we don't have the information we need. That's why I defer the petition and, and, and convene a CHAP. I think that that would be a prudent way to go. Well, why the CHAP? Uh, I think, first of all, uh, and I can't remember who said I think it was Commissioner Robinson, uh, in addition to our extraordinarily distinguished staff and to some of the most uh, advanced researchers testifying before us, the CHAP uh, is something that is uh, uh, nominated by uh, the director of the National Academy of Sciences from whom we choose a group of eminent scientists to help us fill in the gaps. Uh, the reason I say that we should move to rulemaking in the CHAP is because I do think there is more than enough evidence of toxicity and exposure to proceed, but when it comes to rulemaking, uh, you need to have uh, a, the scope of the issue and to have them come up with their suggestions as the precise scientific methodology to use for filling in data gaps. Uh, I have no question, but there are uh, protocols and methodologies for uh, gap filling, but I think it would be a useful exercise, in fact, a critical exercise to have a group of eminent scientists give us their best consensus about the best way to fill in data gaps. Commissioner Adler, historically within this agency, we have, when a petition is granted, it then goes back to staff for their advice. And generally, uh, only in, in my knowledge, with regards to phthalates, have we convened a CHAP. Why convene a CHAP? Why not send this package, this petition, back to staff and ask them for their expert advice? Well, I think we're doing both. Uh, and as I say, part of this, is, and I, the, the other point I forgot to mention was, uh, that uh, I think it's going to be less burdensome on the staff to have 
a chap assisting them in their assessment of the scope of uh, the rule that we would come up with with uh, respect to OFRs. So uh, I'm not denying them work on the petition. I'm saying we are granting it, please start work. But I think one of the best ways of doing that, and I heard no f pushback from staff about the designation of a chap. I think uh, we all agree that a chap makes an enormous amount of sense in, the, in, in this circumstance. I would also add that uh, when Congress wrote Section 28 of the CPSA, I don't think they were thinking that in CPSIA they would have given us the option of making CHAPs discretionary. And so it's in a sense, uh, pursuing a CHAP is carrying out congressional intent. My time has expired. Commissioner Robinson. Chairman Burkle said that we can't, she said that we've been told we can't extrapolate across data gaps. That's exactly the opposite of what I heard from um, almost 40 witnesses, that we can extrapolate, that there are scientifically acceptable ways to extrapolate across data gaps. And um, I, I guess in terms of this, this granting the petition in the chat, I am absolutely flummoxed at the incredibly impassioned but irrelevant speech that Commissioner Mohorovic gave about politicization. I have absolutely no clue what the science of this petition and these flame retardants has to do with whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, nor do I understand what it has to do with my term potentially being up. I just have no clue. But I guess I would just ask you, Commissioner Adler, <laughs> were you uh, in, in your discussions with Commissioner Mohorovic and Chairman Burkle about whether they would support granting the petition or support this motion, did they raise any concerns that were relevant to this petition that they wanted to make trades on. And also, are you being influenced at all by the fact that you're a Democrat? Well, let me answer the last part first. I, I've always maintained and I continue to maintain the hope and the belief that product safety is not a partisan issue. It should never be politicized. Um, I think at times we dip into those troubled waters, but for the most part, I actually think we've been very good about not doing that. With respect to my negotiations with Commissioner uh, Mohorovic and Chairman Burkle, we have, uh, I don't know if it's a written rule, but an unwritten rule that we don't disclose the nature of negotiations. And I think that's to preserve uh, candor and a good, uh, robust exchange of views. So with all due respect, I'm going to decline to answer that question. And, and I fully respect that, which is why I didn't ask for specifics. I'm just asking if there were any concerns raised that were relevant to this petition that you and anyone else who's going to support granting the petition or I could do that are relevant to this petition. And I appreciate your attempt to thread that needle. I think it's a very subtle and clever way of doing that. But again, with all due respect, I'm going to decline to discuss the negotiations that I've had with them. I guess my only follow-up question would be under FISA, um, do you agree with me that once we know that s some of these substances may be toxic or may cause um, harm, that that triggers our responsibility to do something about it? Well, with respect to FHSA, I don't pronounce it FISA because then we might get it confused with a, Sorry. <laughs> another statute. <laughs> I've been thinking about FISA recently. Yeah, so I, uh, but the answer is yes, I completely agree with that. Thank you. I'm not Thank you. Commissioner Kay? No questions at this time. Thank you. Commissioner Mohorovic? No questions. Thank you. At this time, we will take a brief recess to discuss some procedural issues.
I apologize for the delay. We will now resume our uh, public meeting at the Consumer Product Safety Commission regarding um, the petition on HP 15-1. Uh, we were uh, in the process of asking Commissioner Adler any questions uh, regarding his motion. And uh, I do have an additional question, and then we will uh, continue any rounds of questions the commissioners might have, and then we will proceed from there. So we talked um, a little bit about having enough information that we could comfortably feel like these organohalogens, despite the fact there are data gaps, that we've not found one that isn't hazardous where the research has been done. I, I want to call um, attention to the briefing package, and this is staff's position to us, and this is what gives me pause, because they mentioned that the limited data on OFRs show varying toxicity and exposure potential among individual OFR compounds. These varying properties of individual OFR compounds indicate that OFRs, in fact, represent several subclasses of chemicals that should be examined separately. So, uh, and I will um, yield my time to you, Commissioner Adler, if you could respond to that. Yeah, I, and I do want to repeat that I'm not taking issue with any of the science of our technical staff. I think they're really uh, distinguished. Uh, uh, scientists and it's always a pleasure to work with them. My issue with the staff conclusion is with respect to the policy and legal implications that flow from their scientific findings. Uh, and I think I was pretty clear in saying that I grant that uh, different OFRs present differing levels of toxicity. Uh, but I repeat, it's the difference between getting hit by a sedan or getting hit by a truck. Uh, if they both have uh, sufficient uh, common characteristics that present a hazard, then I think we have all we need to know to address them as a class. Uh, and with respect to exposure, the, the big uh, point that I thought uh, Dr. Birnbaum made was that uh, when it comes to OFRs, they don't walk up one by one and say, look at me separately, that we get them uh, in mixtures and all of the evidence to date suggests that the mixtures that we're actually exposed to in the real world uh, present a sufficient enough hazard so that we should take uh, legal action. But again, I'm not challenging uh, the staff science. Uh, I don't like playing scientists and I, I hope our scientists don't play lawyer. Thank you, Commissioner Edler. One other question, um, and we have been receiving uh, correspondence. This is this has been a very tight uh, time frame with, from regard from the public hearing to to today, uh, from various, uh, and we have in the record already uh, a letter from NEMA. We heard additional, we got additional information this morning with regards to electronics and the issue with electronics and safety. And so the distinction is made that electronics and the use of flame retardants when it comes to electronics is very different than the other three categories in that there is a safety issue, there is heat, there's real heat when it comes to electronics. And beyond that, um, we are talking about uh, a true safety issue. In some of the other cases, uh, and as we know, the flame retardants are not in all children's products. Our staff has indicated that's not the, the situation as well as um, with regards to, to furniture. But the, the distinction is made with this class of chemicals that there is a real safety component. And my concern is that if we ban this group of chemicals that are used in flame retardants, that we are we are truly creating a, an environment where we are not, we are we've moved away from safety, in the interest of the chemicals. But we are we are not we do not have our eye on flammability in those issues, and fire issues. And so, if you could comment on that in the letter that was sent to us. Well, thank you very much, and I absolutely agree that uh, one of the challenges of this commission is addressing simultaneously fire hazards and chemical hazards, and what we always have to do is achieve a, an appropriate balance. Uh, I do think this is something that the CHAP ought to look into carefully. Uh, 
uh, but I will repeat what I believe to be the case and why the petition was so carefully crafted. What uh, the petitioner said is with respect to the innards of electronic devices, uh, they take no position whatsoever about the use of uh, flame retardants, including organohalogen flame retardants. It's simply and solely with respect to the casing, the plastic casing that need not have organohalogen flame retardants because uh, that's where the exposure and the migration uh, from the product occurs. So I think it's a very carefully drawn uh, petition. That said, let us hope that this is looked into very, very carefully. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson, do you have any additional questions? I, I just have an additional comment, and this has been, as I, as I mentioned in my statement in support of this, um, motion. This has been one of the most frustrating things with the people who have opposed this petition is that they don't stay relevant to the very carefully drawn boundaries of the petition. And we've heard from NEMA on several occasions, but they're always talking about the danger of these chemicals inside the electronics, and that has absolutely nothing to do with this carefully crafted. Um, petition that it deals with the plastic casings only. And I think we may be the only country that has flame retardants in the plastic casings. And that um, is something that has been very frustrating. Thank you. Commissioner Kay? Nothing further. Thank you. Commissioner Mohorovic? Nothing further. Thank you. Um, at this point, I have an additional um, amendment to Commissioner Adler's motion. And uh, so if I could uh, entertain that before we have a vote on the underlying motion, Commissioner Adler. I don't think I have any choice, but please go ahead. You, you're all, I, not that I know Robert's rules of orders. That's why we have a, a general counsel to advise us on procedure. Uh, but I think this is consistent with the procedure and with the advice we've been given by our general counsel. So please proceed. Thank you. Uh, the effect of my motion, if it uh, is adopted, is to allow a vote separate from the uh, CHAP and from the petition to separate out those two votes. So my motion is to um, amend Commissioner Adler's motion to strike the words uh, in his motion beginning with under uh, Roman numeral four, take other action from grant until uh, up to and including and direct staff would be, uh, that would be included. So it would essentially separate out the vote on the CHAP uh, as well as uh, the petition, the underlying petition. I need a second to proceed. Second. Thank you. Are there any questions? Commissioner Robinson, any questions? Mr. Uh, Kay? Can I just uh, seek some clarification? So does it change any of the words, Madam Chair, or it literally just bifurcates the first two directions in Commissioner Adler's motion? That's correct. It just bifurcates. It doesn't change. It just gives uh, the commission an opportunity to separate out the votes on whether to convene a CHAP and then beyond whether to convene a CHAP to vote to grant, deny, or defer the petition. So if your motion were agreed to, we still would have to vote on the two separate questions that would be created by your motion? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mohorovic? Nothing. Having no, heard uh, no other questions, um, we will call for a vote to bifurcate uh, the amendment to uh, So uh, the, there is asking for some clarification uh, on my amendment to uh, amend Commissioner Adler's motion. 
uh, with regards to what effect that would have. So it is removing the words grant in, in Commissioner Adler's motion to up and including the word and. So uh, it would be the opportunity for the commission to vote on those two issues, granting a petition, whether it's granted, denied, or deferred separately from whether or not we convene a CHAP. Uh, now I'm a little bit confused. So in effect, your motion is simply that we direct staff to convene a CHAP. That, that's the essence of the vote right now. If I may, that's actually you the may. opposite of what I heard. Th me was, too, that's why. Because I thought that to. this was a procedural step first to separate out the two, and then we would vote on the two as individual motions. If I, if I might, I'm, I'm prepared to do it either way, but, and, and if you want to vote on the convening of a chat before we move to the vote on whether or not to grant, I'm fine with that. I just need to know what we're voting on, and maybe hear from the You can have two motions. Um, uh, Commissioner, uh, Chairman Burkle. So if you want to have one motion where you're directing staff to convene a CHAP, and then that could be voted on. And if you want to have a, a third motion uh, to amend, I'm calling it motion, excuse me, you're amending Commissioner Adler's motion that's on the table. You could then have a third uh, amendment to his, his motion to grant or defer or deny the petition. So if you want to break it out that way, that would be permissible. And so if we do, don't break it up, uh, and instead we vote on whether or not to convene a CHAP, and then the underlying vote is whether or not to deny grant or No, the, the underlying vote is still on. You're amending Commissioner Adler's motion, so that's on the table. So the underlying vote would still be Commissioner Adler's. So, but you could have two motions to accomplish what I think I hear you saying yes, you want yeah. to accomplish. I have to see if there's consensus among my colleagues to move. Um, again, I'm not entirely clear on what we're voting, but if, just to clarify, if the vote before us right now in terms of her motion is whether or not to convene a CHAP, and that's the vote, uh, then I understand it. I would like then to ask for a five minute or two minute uh, uh, <laughs> uh, recess to further discuss this. That's fine. That's okay. Fine.
We are going to resume our uh, public hearing on petition HP 15-1 rulemaking, requesting rulemaking on certain products containing organohalogen flame retardants. Uh, on the table is a, an amendment uh, that I have proposed on Commissioner Adler's motion, and I'm going to call a vote on that, and then we will vote on Commissioner Adler's underlying motion. Commissioner Adler, how do you vote? Um, I vote no on what I understand the motion to be before us. I'm certainly not, in, not voting no on the convening of a chap, so my vote is no. Commissioner Robinson? No. Commissioner Kay? Uh, no for similar reasons that Commissioner Adler articulated. Commissioner Mohorovic? Are we explaining votes now or are we just voting? Yes. And I vote aye. The uh, nays are three, the ayes are two, and the uh, nays have it. We will now take a vote unless there are any other questions on the underlying motion from Commissioner Adler. Are there any other questions? Commissioner Robinson? No. Commissioner Kay? No, thank you. Commissioner no. Mohorovic? We'll now call the vote on Commissioner Adler's motion. Commissioner Adler, how do you vote? I vote aye. Commissioner Robinson? Aye. Commissioner Kay? Aye. Commissioner Mohorovic? No. And I vote no. The ayes are three, the noes are two, and Commissioner Adler's motion is passed. Are there any other motions uh, here this morning? Yes, Madam Chairman, I have a motion. Uh, I believe it's been distributed, am I correct? Thank you, Commissioner Adler. You have up to three minutes to explain your motion, and, and then we will uh, ask for a second. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. My second motion is to instruct staff to a, a publish a Federal Register notice attached that provides guidance to the public on the hazards of additive non-polymeric organohalogen flame retardants. Again, I will refer to them in shorthand as OFRs in the four product categories identified in the 2015 petition. I'm delighted that the Commission has voted to grant the petition and to convene a CHAP. In the meantime, however, it seems necessary and appropriate to alert the public to the identified risks of OFRs. As we all know, the work of a CHAP to deal with issues like those before us will take many months, if not years. Accordingly, I've moved that the Commission approve a guidance document for manufacturers, distributors, retailers, and consumers in which we advise manufacturers to refrain from adding OFRs to their products and urges distributors, retailers, and consumers to inquire about the existence of OFRs in the products they buy and to avoid purchasing such products. Let me anticipate an objection that I know is going to be lodged about this guidance. In essence, it will be, how can we undertake the convening of a CHAP with the likely outcome being a rule to ban OFRs when the Commission has already staked out a position that OFRs are too hazardous to use? The simple answer is that a guidance document is just that, guidance. It is not a rule. It imposes no obligations on anyone to do anything or to refrain from doing anything. It is simply advice to the public about our carefully measured conclusion that OFRs are too hazardous to put in certain consumer products. On this point, I note that the Commission has issued similar guidance documents before on lead in consumer products and on hazardous chemicals in children's products. In these cases, the Commission did exactly what we propose to do here indicate the agency's belief that the use of certain chemicals is, and these were words from the uh, CFR, ill-advised and encourage members of the public to avoid using them. I would remind everyone that one of the four stated purposes of the Consumer Product Safety Act is to assist consumers in evaluating the comparative safety of consumer products. I would also remind everyone that we have a talented Office of Communications whose everyday job is to provide information to the public similar to what is in this guidance document to carry out that part of our mission. This document is fully consistent with the work that office does and with our obligations to provide meaningful information to the public. Having listened carefully to the unanimous testimony of some of the most distinguished governmental and academic scientists on the subject, I've concluded that we must not sit idly by and wait for data on the safety of, our, of OFRs that all evidence to date suggests will never come. As one of the witnesses at our hearing pointed out, if we took the tobacco industry's word on cigarette safety, we'd still be waiting. Similarly, we have waited for years for our friends in the chemical industry to provide us with credible evidence that there are safe OFRs. 
I have little doubt that we will still be waiting for many years to no avail. In short, this guidance document will cert serve to alert the public to a serious hazard and will encourage them to exercise their freedom of choice to avoid this hazard. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, we, the commissioners now will have uh, five minutes to ask questions of Commissioner Adler. Uh, and if there is time left for their questions, they can yield their time to you. Otherwise, uh, you may answer at the end. Um, one of the issues I've raised throughout the course of this morning is the fact that the same, these things seem to be out of order. Uh, and this just adds to it. Uh, we are, our staff told us there were data gaps. Our staff recommended to us that we deny this petition. Our staff made it very clear to us that while we have some information on organohalogens uh, and these flame retardants, that there are data gaps and that it is most prudent as a data-driven agency, as an agency that should be relying on science, that we, um, that we look at these chemicals individually. And now we're about to go out with guidance. The public holds this agency in high esteem and what we say has an effect on how the public reacts. They take our word very seriously. And we are about to put out guidance that is not based on hard data. It's not based on hard science. It is just the opinion of the majority of this commission that we are going to put out this word that we think, without having the data or the science behind us, that we think these chemicals should be avoided. I would like to understand how the ordinary American citizen can figure out what the heck chemical is in their product. You're putting out this guidance and they have no idea of what the heck you're talking about. Most things, our staff has indicated to us, only about 22% of children's products seem to have some trace of flame retardants in them. Furniture, we know, TB117 and the way UFAC and the way the industry has gone, most furniture for residential use does not have flame retardants in it. The concern I have, and I've raised it already this morning, is with electronics. We are about to, we've, we've already voted to ban, to ban a whole class of chemicals regarding flame retardants and the use in electronics. And now we're going to turn over to the, to the public, the American people, who holds our opinion in high esteem, or at least they should, when it's based on science and data. We, we, we're about to say to them, don't use these products. We've got an industry that is relying on voluntary standards that has flame retardants in their electronics casings for safety purposes to prevent fire. And we're about to say, oh, American public, please stay away from these flame retardants. I think it's out of order. I think it is premature. And I think it's, uh, it's just not a prudent way to proceed. I have about two and a half minutes left. Or maybe they didn't turn on the time. Seems like a long time. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you for your comments. Um, and I would simply say that I couldn't disagree more strongly about the notion of not having hard data and having hard science. We have tremendous amount of hard data and hard science. Uh, and that was the unanimous view of some of the most distinguished scientists in the field, all of whom were saying that, yes, there are data gaps, there are protocols uh, and methodologies for addressing the data gaps. Uh, I'm a little distressed to hear the notion that we shouldn't regulate something because it's only found in 22% of our products. My God, uh, I th we, we go out of our way to try to protect people against the existence will, of will one the hazard. Will the commissioner yield back? Uh, of course. Well, yes, 22%, but I would suggest that that's the place to start. We can prioritize. We have to ask our staff every day of the week to prioritize our resources, prioritize where the, the greatest hazard and the risks are. And, and if we know and we know that 22% of these children's products have them, then start there with the analysis to make some determination with regards to, to the data and the science. I yield back. If I might reclaim some of your time. Uh, I think that is what it, we're doing precisely. We are going after the 22% of the products that have these organohalogen flame retardants. Nobody's touching any of the other products that don't have these chemicals. So uh, that it's a narrowly focused approach. Um, and 
I think it, it sells the public short that nobody's asking them to understand the biochemistry of organohalogens. What we're saying is go in and ask whether they're in the products you're about to buy. As anybody who knows parents or who is a parent, uh, when you go to the, uh, the, the toy store or to the children's product store, you pepper the clerks with questions, some of which they can answer, some of which they can't, but uh, we're a much more well-informed society and we're asking these critical questions. Uh, and that certainly is within the ability of consumers to go uh, when they're making purchases. So I do think this is permitting freedom of choice. If somebody wants to buy products that have organohalogen flame retardants, I think they can probably still find them. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Commissioner Adler, for this uh, motion, and I intend to support it. It's absolutely based on the science, absolutely based on the data, and com uh, Chairman Burkle is completely ignoring that there are scientifically acceptable ways to bridge the gaps, that the information we have from the top toxicologists in the country absolutely support that these, uh, that these organohalogens, as described in the petition, are toxic. And the only people who are opposed to it have a financial interest in continuing to put these products out. And that's the group with which um, Chairman Burkle has chosen to side. Um, convening the chapel take time. We've talked about that. I'm very concerned about the, these OFRs and their ubiquitous use in all of these product categories while the chap is working through the issues. Amazingly, in many of the products, there's absolutely no utility to having the OFRs. I think the one that was most appalling that we heard in last week's hearing was that a ch child's product that's intended to be submerged in water in the bath contained these OFRs. Uh, uh, they're unnecessary, they serve no purpose, and yet we continue to expose our children, um, our most vulnerable population, to potential harmful health effects related to these OFRs. Additionally, many of our imported products contain these OFRs that do not pri provide any benefit. And as we heard at last week's hearing and in 2015's hearing of those OFRs about which we have data, we know they migrate into the household dust when used in additive form and then make it into our bodies. And we know there is evidence of harmful health effects. I'm sure we all hate the fact that almost every one of us in this, in this country um, and in the Western world have OFRs in our blood and urine. And our, we, I'm absolutely alarmed at the amounts we have in our infants and our children. We're, we're leaving the next generation is so appalling. And we watch literally daily and hourly right now that playing out. We've watched increasingly alarming developments in the human species, such, such as increasing numbers of cancers and reproductive development problems, such as sperm counts being halved. Therefore, I support issuing the guidance that, that uh, the Commissioner Adler has proposed to the manufacturers, suppliers, importers, and retailers, I certainly hope that Chairman Burkle is correct that people look to us for guidance. So please do not use these particular OFRs. They are not necessary. There are safe ones to use. If the purpose of using the OFRs is for fire prevention, seek alternatives. And um, I must say that in, in response to this, uh, the, the, the statement about electronic casings, that's not any of the testimony that we've heard. We know that OFRs are important inside of electronics, and that's the only kind of testimony that we've heard as to where they're needed. It's imperative that the CPSC be as transparent in what we do and that we inform the public about potential health risks and harmful health effects. We have a responsibility to inform all of our stakeholders, the business community, and consumers about what we have learned about OFRs to date. Again, we're not able to conclude rulemaking just yet, but in the interim, the public has a right to know about our alarming evidence that has been presented. And this guidance is the perfect mechanism to do this. Thank you again, Commissioner Adler. And I have a minute and a half left if you would like to address anything further. Uh, nothing further at this time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Adler, thank you as well for this uh, motion and, again, this long overdue public statement if it's approved or public guidance from the Commission on this issue. We often refer to you um, as our historian, the agency's historian, and it's been referenced uh, a little bit earlier about the amount of data or lack thereof and scientific evidence. In your experience, 
from all the issues that you've been part of, both at the staff level and at the commission level, basically almost since the inception of the commission in the early 70s, uh, where does this rank in terms of, just roughly, about the level of evidence that's in front of us in terms of our action? Well, I think if you review the uh, CFR, you'll see that the Commission has taken action over the years on a number of products, including asbestos and carbon tetrachloride and a variety of other toxic chemicals. And I dare say that when we were pro uh, addressing these, we did not study their existence in every individual product in which they appeared. Uh, and uh, as uh, Ms. Hadlett said, uh, asbestos in particular comes in, a, in different varieties. But when we were issuing our uh, regulations uh, on asbestos, we took it as given, and I think there's no question about it, that asbestos in almost any form is a very, very serious carcinogenic hazard. Uh, and I would just say, again, picking up on the point about what other agencies do, I think we've seen evidence that EPA uh, addresses products as a class, and we saw that with respect to the PFAs, that FDA addressed the class of uh, those chemicals, and they explicitly said they did not have specific toxicity data with respect to all of the PFAs. They just said they're enough of a kiss and cousin to uh, address all of them, and I think that's exactly analogous to the issue before us. Thank you for that. And in terms of the evidence that is in front of us, are you aware in the record of any evidence that uh, these particular flame retardants are effective? Well, that is a hotly contested issue, but if you look to the testimony of a number of the witnesses before us, they said that actually the OFRs in the concentrations where they appear, for example, in upholstered furniture provide almost no marginal safety that you'd really have to douse them the way we do, unfortunately, business furniture for them to have more of an effect. So that even though in certain tests they, they may show safety, uh, in the concentrations in which they're appearing, the only thing they seem able to do is to prevent, present a health hazard uh, as opposed to preventing uh, a fire hazard. I would not want to go so far as to say they never work under any circumstance whatsoever, but I do think that when you're trying to balance the safety w with respect to fire hazards versus the health hazards, I think it's not even a close call. And how about your understanding of whether or not there are other alternatives to address uh, the legitimate fire safety concerns? Um, yeah, and I find, find this fascinating. When you listen even to the testimony of the industry folks, they didn't say that they lack alternative flame retardants. What they said is these are the cheapest. Uh, and so that's actually one of the points where you want to have government step in and say we're not going to allow manufacturers to compete on the basis of risk. That if there's a minimum standard that everybody must meet, then they're all competing from a level playing field. And that way, whatever cost considerations there are, are worked out in the wash. But we're not saying to people, you get to compete by making a cheaper but far more dangerous product. Thank you, Commissioner Adler. Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Madam Chairman, Commissioner Adler, um, I, I really wish you had put this language in a statement and solicited it for support among uh, your colleagues uh, because this kind of language as it appears as official commission guidance uh, couldn't be more inappropriate. Uh, it will become one of the um, next best examples of regulatory dark matter, backdoor rulemaking. Um, to suggest that, let's give some of the examples. You said that it, it imposes no obligations. For anybody to think uh, in practical purposes in the business environment that language like this from a regulatory agency imposes no obligation would be completely naive, be completely naive. Uh, the language uh, that you're suggesting here in official commission guidance includes uh, manufacturers refrain, importers, distributors, and retailers obtain assurances. Uh, your language here that you're also suggesting the Commission is going to adopt uh, includes based on the overwhelming scientific evidence presented to the Commission to date. I recognize that the scientific evidence that did not convince the C staff CPSC of the, of the worthiness to adopt this petition. 
So, I mean, to suggest that it's overwhelming scientific evidence, it wasn't so overwhelming as to persuade our technical staff. Uh, you know, agencies at their worst can move outside of the bounds of due process and procedural safeguards and impose um, obligations. Uh, they can become bullies. Uh, this agency in particular in academic res uh, research and literature has been cited as an example for bullying tactics, for being, for mafia tactics, like the Godfather, I'll give you an offer you can't refuse. Like, oh, no, no, this is just, this is just guidance. We're only making these recommendations gently. You can do whatever you want. Um, you know, but by the way, you regulated parties, if you decide not to, we're going to invoke, you know, the responsible corporate officer doctrine, so pay attention to CEOs, uh, pay attention to all the other ways that we can make your life miserable. To assume that this guidance would just be a mere recommendation is so thoroughly naive. It's for this exact reason why the Congressional Review Act includes guidance. And when I spoke earlier about why I'm so disappointed that um, uh, you and my uh, esteemed Democratic colleagues have not decided to forge a bipartisan solution and, and way forward for the agency, is you're now in adding insult to injury to an extent. And maybe, now I'm not injured or insulted. Uh, however, others looking at the actions of this agency, uh, you're now going to jeopardize, I would assume, the, the funding for the CHAP, the funding for this rulemaking moving forward because of the desire to go one step too far. You could have used the same language as it would have been appropriate in a statement from yourself individually or from a collection of, uh, uh, or from other colleagues as well to sign on to it. Um, it moves way too far. I think you'll look back on this moment and you will have to, you will find out, you will look back on this moment and consider it a very Pyrrhic victory. You have the votes, you will, you will, you will uh, win the day. You will certainly win the day. But I hope those colleagues out there that care and spend so much time on this will hold decision makers' feet to the fire in terms of thinking long term about this. Because this whole project might be very, very quickly put on hold because of politicizing it to the extent that suggesting commission guidance uh, of this nature is completely uh, inappropriate. Uh, if anybody would take the time and effort to challenge it in court, it would be easily dismissed as an egregious example of uh, depriving due process. This is why we have formal rulemaking to come to the conclusions that you just reach in the end. Uh, it also subjects this agency to more ridicule because it really asks the rational question, why are you going to convene a CHAP and spend all this money and get all these resources when you've already come to the conclusions, just to make your case once again in the end? Um, it's, it's something that I wish uh, you only did in a, in a statement with your colleagues, and um, uh, I won't be able to support it. Uh, and uh, I wish uh, you had only done this as a, as a statement as would have been procedurally appropriate. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Mohorovic. Commissioner Adler, you now have five minutes to respond to the questions. Thank you very much. And uh, it's always a delight to be here and debate uh, Commissioner Mohorovic. Uh, and I particularly love his ability to craft metaphors and to paint vivid word pictures. I wish I had half the talent to do that. And as I say, he always turns out to be a better lawyer as an MBA than I turn out to be an MBA as a lawyer. Um, so I guess for me, uh, uh, a couple of points. First of all, I see a disconnect between saying, gee, you should do a statement, but don't do a guidance document. It is, is it your notion that a statement would just not be, uh, would not have any effect on the public? Because if it did have an effect on the public, then it's reaching precisely the same outcome. We're trying to get the public's attention and trying to give them advice about what to do. Uh, I do think that, uh, first of all, I'm not naive, I, and you're, you're absolutely correct. I hope this has a dramatic impact on the marketplace, just as if we were to do a statement, I would hope the statement would have a dramatic impact on the public. This is a more serious matter, and therefore I think it calls for a more serious step. But this step is not rulemaking. Uh, I venture to say that uh, there is no sanction whatsoever that the Commission will ever bring for somebody saying, well, we've read their guidance document and we just disagree. 
uh, and we're going to proceed to produce our products. Uh, I would also remind everybody that when the industry folks were testifying before us, I specifically asked them whether they planned on continuing OFRs uh, unless the government stopped them. And uh, reading between the lines, they were all saying, you're damn right we're going to continue producing those unless and until the government stops us. This is not ordering them to stop. This is urging them to stop. But equally importantly, it's saying to members of the public uh, a point that uh, Commissioner Mohorovic often makes, which is give people the information and give them the freedom to choose. This is giving people the information and giving them the freedom to choose. Um, and uh, I've never really been affiliated with uh, dark matter before, but I guess I revel in it. And I, th I thank you for, for pointing that out. And I, as I say, I really always appreciate Commissioner Mo Mohorovic's statement. Thank you, Commissioner Adler. Are there any other questions from the commissioners? Commissioner Robinson? No. Commissioner Kay? No, thank you. Commissioner Mohorovic? No, I don't. And I do not have any additional questions. So having no further questions to Commissioner Adler, uh, we will move uh, to vote on the motion. Uh, Commissioner Adler, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Robinson? Aye. Commissioner Kay? Aye. Commissioner Mohorovic? No. And I vote no. The ayes are two, the nays are three, the nays have it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry, yes, Freudian. Um, the uh, yeah, uh, ayes have it, three uh, votes, and the nays are two. They do not have it. Uh, we will now turn to closing statements. Uh, we will have up to 10 minutes for those, and I will go first. We know from history uh, that one-sided partisan solutions do not end well. Compromise and engagement with the other party can often go a long way towards a permanent solution. In the case at hand, serious attempts with many offers were made as recent as today. What if we defer the, the petition, direct a CHAP, and not have a guidance statement? What if we granted the petition, directed a CHAP, adopted TB 117, and stopped work on NFPA 277 for a more immediate solution? What if we grant the petition and send it back to staff for their advice rather than convening a CHAP and issuing a guidance document? In the end, there was no compromise and no willingness to sustain a chartable, to, to chart a sustainable course. Without a doubt, the petition before us presents a challenging problem for regulators. There appears to be little doubt that some organohalogen flame retardants may be toxic. At this point, however, I'm not near convinced that it is appropriate to treat this huge, unwieldy, amorphous group of chemicals as if they are a homogeneous class. As CPSC staff has pointed out on numerous occasions, but in the briefing memo, the readily available data show widely varied, varying toxicity and exposure potential among differing OFR compounds. My de Democratic colleagues claim that there is an overwhelming scientific evidence of toxicity and exposure across the class, and indeed we heard witnesses at our hearing last week that maintain that every organohalogen that has been adequately studied has been found to cause adverse effects. Even if that is accepted as true, do such adverse effects result from prevailing exposures? We know that substances as benign as water and oxygen two of the most essential requirements for human existence can cause death when too much is inhaled or imbibed. Is there something exceptional about organohalogens such that the dose becomes unimportant? We know from our recent work on phthalates that seemingly minor differences in the structure of a molecule, even within a much smaller family of chemicals, can make a huge difference when it comes to human health effects. We also heard last week that the European regulators, famous for their precautionary principle, not for their solicitude of chemical manufacturers, after long study have chosen not to regulate some organohalogens in recent years. Are American children at greater risk than European children? Is there something about organohalogens that makes them uniquely different than other substances? I would like to know much more about the subject before I adopt that prevailing view of my colleagues, which conflicts with much of what we know about chemicals generally. Here is where I thought a CHAP might be useful. 
I would welcome having a panel of independent experts advising us on matters such as this. But for the, re the very reason that the CHAP could have been useful to us, it is premature to grant the petition and to commit to rulemaking. We should hear from the CHAP first and then decide whether or not it makes any kind of sense to proceed with regulation and how we would proceed. Or we could have granted the petition and sent it back to staff for their recommendation. It is even, even, it is even more premature to recommend against using organohalogen flame retardants before we have the benefit of the CHAP's expertise. My colleagues are being very cavalier about passing sentence on an untold number of chemicals over the objection of our staff, whom I considered to be the experts, and before we hear from the CHAP, they insist upon. It appears my colleagues have now become the scientists. There is another layer of complexity to this issue. Organohalogens are used in flame retardants for a reason. If their use is discontinued based upon our recommendation, what will be the ramifications for, safety, for, for, for fire safety? Are there equally effective, less toxic flame retardants for all current <coughs> applications of organohalogens? Who is considering that trade-off? Safety convergence is the intersection of safety and chemical safety. I appreciate staff's work on the petition, which asked the commission to initiate rulemaking to declare four categories of consumer products containing additive organohalogen flame retardants to be banned as a hazard substance under FH FHSA. While I appreciate my colleague, Commissioner Adler's hard work on this issue, I did not support, nor do I support, granting the petition at this time, nor can I support his motion to advance a CHAP or issue a guidance document on the use of flame retardants, as doing so would be extremely premature. Issuing this guidance doc document is now putting the cart before the horse. Why are we looking to invest the resources of a CHAP if we already know enough to recommend discontinu discontinuing the whole class of chemicals? The truth is, we don't know enough. I'm not aware of many cases when federal agencies have banned large classes of chemicals, and the few I have heard about have not ended well. In the last few years, com Congress has become very concerned about federal agencies and the use of guidance documents. Today's vote proves the point. They take a strong position on a controversial subject without the usual safeguards of rulemaking. It seems obvious that one way to limit the use of organohalogens without spurring regretta, regretta, excuse me, regrettable substitutions would be to adopt California's standard TB11713. Indeed, ironically enough, several of the petitioners and participants in this proceeding have advocated for that course. They've begged us as an agency to adopt TB11713, which has essentially become a de facto national standard. If this commission is so concerned about the use of organohalogens in consumer products, then why refuse to accept the staff's recommendation to discontinue its current rulemaking on upholstered furniture flammability? Why not embrace TB 117-13 as a standard that eliminates the need for many of the flame retardants used in furniture? It would be far more effective certainly uh, efficient to adopt TB 117-13 as a federal standard and then to initiate a CHAP, which as we know from our recent experience with the congressionally mandated phthalates CHAP, can take almost a decade to produce results. I do not think our agency is best suited to decide whether the use of certain chemicals should be banned. Congress just spent a tremendous amount of work on TSCA reform. It would seem that the EPA is far better positioned to address the petitioner's concern rather than the, than the CPSC. And I would add at that point, the EPA has a budget of $6 billion. Our budget hovers around $125 million. I would make an argument the EPA is far suited, far better suited to take on this, this challenge. Having rejected the staff's recommendation to deny the petition, the commission adds insult to injury. It gives the staff, staff no opportunity to advise us on how to proceed once the majority decides to grant the petition. If the commission decides that granting the petition is the right course, it should seek the staff's recommendation on how best to proceed. Instead, the commission takes over the matter, dictating the initiation of a CHAP 
getting into detail about the scope of the matter without hearing from our own staff experts. The staff has a much better appreciation of the scale of the project and the impact on resources. We should have given them a chance to advise us rather than to hijack the process. Commissioner Adler. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. And just a couple of quick comments. Uh, first of all, I would remind you that um, your advocacy of TB117 goes counter to the staff's recommendation on TB117. In fact, the staff is strongly opposed to uh, moving to adopt that. Now that said, uh, one of the discussions that you and I have had does revolve around TB117 and I have pledged to you and I, I mean to stand by my pledge to go out and sit down once again and talk to staff and see exactly what their technical objections to TB117 are and to see whether or not there's some movement that we can make uh, with respect to if not precisely mandating TB117 to finding some way of common ground and I appreciate your work and your uh, uh, feelings on the matter and, and I'm not in disagreement with those. Um, I would also take issue with your notion that we are putting the staff in a straitjacket. Uh, as I say, I don't question the staff's scientific expertise whatsoever. Uh, where we part company is on what the follow-up law and policy should be. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, we have given staff broad discretion, both with respect to addressing the granting of the petition and with respect to convening of a CHAP. And if there's any issue or question about that, I invite staff to come back and, and discuss that with the commission. Um, what I would like to note and take a deep breath about is I think we've just witnessed something extraordinary in this agency's history. We've heard testimony from some of the nation's most eminent scientists, both from government and academia, who are on the cutting edge of research into issues relating to chronic hazards, toxicity, and flame retardants. And there was virtual unanimity on several key points, and those are OFRs are everywhere, including our bodies and that of our most vulnerable children. OFRs are toxic and prevent a host of hazards. Cancer, mutagenicity, neurotoxicity, decreased IQ, impaired memory, and I seem to be a good living example of that as my memory fades uh, each day. Learning deficits, endocrine disruption, thyroid interference, and the list goes on and on and on with respect to toxicity. And among the gathered experts, there was virtual unanimity on how best to deal with OFRs. They need to be banned as a class to avoid this notion of regrettable substitution. That is, every time we get enough evidence to identify a hazard, we get a substitution of a product where we have no idea whether it's hazardous, and then there's the eventual discovery that the substitute is equally as bad or worse than the banned chemical, or a more simple way of characterizing it is playing whack-a-mole with the public's and our children's health. I'm proud that we've taken both a short-term and a long-term approach to addressing OFR hazards. In the short run, we've agreed to provide advice and guidance to the public about the use of OFRs in various consumer products, and that is let's eliminate them and let's avoid them. And in the long run, we've begun the arduous journey to regulatory action by granting the petition to ban OFRs and convening a CHAP to document the full extent of OFR hazards. I want to thank everybody who's worked so tirelessly on this petition. CPSC staff, thank you for your endless patience in meeting with me and answering my endless uh, list of questions and explaining things that even I could understand. So thank you so much. Um, I also want to thank the vast array of witnesses, especially the public health advocates and the academic researchers who put in endless hours preparing testimony, traveling great lengths to share their knowledge and their wisdom and giving us the benefit of that wisdom. Uh, and I particularly want to thank two dedicated public health advocates for their tremendous work and contribution in raising this issue. Eve Gartner, from Earth Justice and Rachel Weintraub, who's sitting here in the audience, and I'm embarrassing her, but I want to thank both of you for just endless, uh, terrific work on these issues. Uh, I would say, judging by the quality of your work, consumer advocacy has never shined more brightly. And again, I want to thank all of my colleagues, uh, including uh, 
Commissioner Mohorovic and Chairman Burkle for being willing to sit down with me and engage in long negotiations about this. And I look forward to further discussion, deliberation, and collaboration. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Adler. Commissioner Robinson. I want to start by thanking Commissioner Adler for convening the second uh, hearing last week um, uh, after staff's re recommendations came out. The truth of the matter is that, as I've told him privately, I at first was not convinced that we needed a second uh, hearing, but as I read the written submissions and listened to the testimony, um, I very much uh, switched my opinion on that. It really cr crystallized for me exactly why we need to grant the petition to prohibit certain products from containing non-polymeric additive organohalogen flame retardants. I also want to thank the many cons presenters in both hearings for their thoughtful written submissions oral testimony and responses to our many, many questions. The record, in addition to the two hearings, consists of over 200 comments and written testimony of several witnesses who were not able to make the hearings. And I want to thank all of you who became so involved in this critically important issue. And I also want to thank our staff. I know you had a huge task in creating, in reviewing this petition and the accompanying science that goes with it. I appreciate that we do not allow you, did not allow you, as you were so um, transparent in saying to us, the kind of time and resources for the decision on this petition that you would have in rulemaking. And any shortcoming in terms of research and data review that were pointed out by the witnesses last week was simply due to these limitations and not in any way the fault of our talented scientists involved in this process. I'm hopeful with the direction we take today to convene the CHAP, you'll be able to arrive at the best solution possible concerning the ubiquitous use and toxicity of this class of OFRs in the four product categories at issue. Um, I'm delighted that Commissioner Adler's motions pass. As I said earlier, I think this is the appropriate path to address concerns on known hazards and to further review and research OFRs to make better informed rulemaking decisions. I believe that the CHAP process is perfectly suited to resolving outstanding questions or concerns related to the OFR petition. And additionally, the guidance voted on today is necessary to inform the public industry and consumers alike of the potential harmful effects from OFRs in the four product categories at issue. And I'm very proud of the work we've done today. As we've heard repeatedly at last week's hearing, there's ample evidence that the OFRs at issue may cause harmful health effects, such as adverse developmental neurotoxicity, endocrine disruption, immune suppression, altered fertility, reduced IQ, metabolic alterations. And additionally, OFRs have been found to be toxic to the liver, carcinogenic, and most harmful to fetuses, nursing infants, and young children. We've received data and supporting evidence that carefully articulated objections in response to SAF's recommendation to deny the petition. To highlight a few, we heard from Dr. Linda Birnbaum, one of the leading uh, preeminent toxologists, toxicologists in the country, as well as the director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Scientists, director of National Toxicology Program, principal investigator in the NIH Intramural Research Program, and former president of the Society of Toxicology. Uh, Dr. Birnbaum testified at both last week's hearing and our hearing in 2015. The information she provided to this process is invaluable. In my opinion, our motion that passed this morning to convene the CHAP is derivative of her suggestion to seek the advice of a formal advisory board, such as the toxicological advisory board used by the CPSC to consult on complex matters from 79 to 85, which I certainly wish we had today. We are taking her advice and seeking input from the CHAP. Many other stakeholders as well as our staff agree that the CHAP is the appropriate and desirable option. After Dr. Birnbaum testified, they went, then we heard hours of testimony from consumer health advocates, clergy, scientists, parents, toxicologists, epidemiologists, activists, nurses, lawyers, and others who advocated vociferously for the CPSC to initiate rulemaking on the petition. Their testimony was supported by pages and pages of cita citations to scientific, peer-reviewed studies on these OFRs. It was a compelling 
uh, the, both of these hearings had contained compelling um, testimony and it was compelling to witness our stakeholder inv investing so much time and energy to ensure that the Commission had all of the information relevant to this potential rulemaking. At the end of the day, we heard from Dr. Vina Singla from the National Resources Defense Council. Her research focuses on chemicals in the indoor environment and she's published on human exposure pathways related to flame retardant chemicals, consumer products, and building materials. Dr. Singla's presentation perfectly summarized the day's information, and I will even go so far as to say the entire record, into just 12 slides. And those 12 slides provided a roadmap for this rulemaking and for the CHAP. She clearly laid out the petition's claim that this class of OFRs are ever present in the four product categories, migrate into the indoor air and dust, and lead to human exposure to these OFRs that may cause harmful health effects. To show that the OFRs in the four product categories are the same OFRs in the dust she proposed using gradient and strength of effect, timing, consistency, and experience experimental evidence and coherence as proof. These claims are backed by sound scientific research. I also appreciate the written and oral presentations of those who agreed with staff's recommendations. However, their reasoning does not absolve us of our responsibilities on the federal, under the Federal Hazardous Substances Act, nor am I convinced that OFRs are necessary or that the benefits outweigh the costs when used in these four product categories. Under the FHSA, the Commission must find that OFRs have the capacity to produce personal injury or illness through reasonable handling or use of products. As I've stated before, we have overwhelming evidence supporting the claim that OFRs that migrate out of consumer products may cause harm when used properly. While we have more data on the toxicity of certain OFRs, we cannot determine that alternative OFRs or replacement OFRs are not just as dangerous, dangerous if not more so, than others. Second, OFRs do not categorically make products flameproof. If a large enough ignition source is involved, flaming combustion of fire retarded items can occur. For smaller ignition sources, smoldering combustion may happen. Furthermore, there are other factors that contribute to the decline in fire deaths, which we've seen in this country, such as the use of smoke alarms, decrease in smoking, updated building codes, as well as fire education safety. For these reasons, coupled with the need for further review of existing research and continued research, it would be absolutely irresponsible of us to dismiss this petition. Furthermore, I found it particularly interesting, as I've said earlier today, that the few presenters who supported not granting the petition were all representatives of industry, trade associations, or companies with a financial interest in keeping OFRs on the market because they either make the OFRs or they make products that already contain the OFRs. In contrast, the scientists, advocates, and others that support the petition had no independent financial interest in this rulemaking. They were there for one reason only. They wanted to protect consumers' health using the available scientific data and evidence to support their claim. Finally, it should be noted that many of the reports received supporting the continued use of flame retardants reference data or studies on chemicals that are, that, or products that fall outside of the scope of the, this petition. It's imperative that we stay within the scope of discussion and only consider relevant and scientific data and research. I would just like to, to say that it, it's important for us to focus on what was voted on today and what my colleagues voted against. We simply voted to have a group of scientists examine what we know about this group of flame retardants and whether they may be toxic in four categories of products. That's it. And we had two commissioners, um, which is of great concern to me, not only vote against it, but try to irrelevantly argue that it had something to do with politics. They had no science to back up their vote against this whatsoever. I do understand that OFRs are everywhere, as is evidenced by the fact that 97 percent of us in this country have them in our blood and urine, but I firmly believe that just because we cannot solve the entire problem does not mean that we can do nothing. This is an issue that simply must be examined. Again, I want to thank everyone for the work that you put in 
um, to get us here today. And I also would like to single out Rachel Weintraub and Eve Gartner for the incredible effort that they put in and the other pe the petitioners for bringing this thoughtful petition. I'm hopeful that with our guidance and the direction to convene the CHAP, the CPSC is well on its we way to informing the public about the potential health effects from the use of these OFRs, as well as working towards a rule that will protect consumers from this potentially harmful class of OFRs. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Robinson. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Adler, thank you very much to you and your staff, your special assistants, Jen Feinberg and Sarah Klein for all the work that was done to get us to where we are today. I know it was a tremendous burden, but it was a great public service. Uh, I voted to grant the petition and- And may we also thank your special assistants for excellent work. Thank you. Uh, I voted to grant the petition and to convene a chat because the overwhelming evidence received by the commission to date indicates that additive non-polymeric organo halogen flame retardants are toxic and the exposure to them in certain consumer products may pose serious health risks to humans, especially pregnant women, young children, and socioeconomically vulnerable populations. Parents and caregivers deserve to know, they deserve to know that their household furniture, electronics, children's products, durable infant products are not exposing them and their families to toxic chemical dust. It shouldn't even have to be stated, but that unfortunately has to be said. For these reasons, I was also pleased to join Commissioners Adler and Robinson in voting to publish guidance in the Federal Register cautioning manufacturers, importers, distributors, retailers, and consumers against these products that might contain or do contain this type of OFR in additive non-polymeric fashion. One of the presenters said to us last week something that I thought perfectly stated what we should do, that we should act based on what we know, not on what we do not know. And at this point, we know a lot. The Commission has received a tremendous amount of information and data, scientifically valid information and data, peer-reviewed published information and data with respect to the toxicity of these chemicals as a class and their potential for widespread exposure. One of the nation's, if not the world's, most knowledgeable toxicologists in this area, Dr. Linda Birnbaum, who is the director, as we've heard, of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, part of the National Institutes of Health. And she's also, at the same time, the director of the National Toxicology Program at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. That's quite a pedigree and exactly the type of person that we want in a position like that and want to seek guidance from on these issues. She has now twice appeared before the Commission and strongly urged us as recently as last week to address the toxicological and health hazards associated with these chemicals in this form. And she even said to us that they are, of all the chemicals out there, they are uh, among the riskiest in her mind, that they should be prioritized as agencies look to safeguard the public. In her expert judgment, all members of the pro proposed class of OFRs in the petition that have been studied has significant health concerns. That is data. That is science. That is expert opinion. Other leading scientists, and Commissioner Robinson referred to one of them, submitted strong scientific evidence demonstrating exposure to these chemicals in this form from certain products that were included in the petition. We have a professional and a moral duty as safety regulators to caution the public now based on the information that we possess. Contrary to some of the objections we've heard, the guidance that we issued today is not a rule. It's not an attempt to forego or replace formal rulemaking on the subject. And there is not any inconsistency in our guidance and the idea that we are a data-driven agency. In fact, it's the opposite. It's entirely based on the data that has been presented. And that data that has been presented from the petition to the first public hearing and through the second one really is overwhelming and I personally cannot in good faith ignore it. As a policymaker and definitely more importantly as a parent, I have to say that I am horrified and outraged at how chemicals are treated in this country. I find it totally irrational that we wait until children are proven to be poisoned before the government is allowed to step in. 
Rational and thoughtful public policy in this area would involve the government and industry and all stakeholders coming together to agree which chemicals are safe for human exposure, especially for pregnant women and children, and which chemicals are not. And more importantly, rational and thoughtful public policy would have those assessments occur before those chemicals are permitted to come into the market. Waiting to assess the safety of chemicals after they are already in our homes and already in our children's bloodstreams is totally irrational public policy. But unfortunately, this is the reality we currently face. Short of an ideal where we can protect children ahead of time, at a minimum, the government agencies entrusted, including the CPSC, entrusted with keeping consumers safe should be organized and adequately funded to quickly make necessary assessments and act to protect the public health, even after chemicals are on the market. If we are going to tolerate a system where chemicals come on the market before we have a sense of their potential health effects, especially on vulnerable populations, it seems fair to expect the government to be equipped to move more quickly to make determinations on the safety of those chemicals and to have the necessary authorities to take action as warranted to protect us all. The Consumer Product Safety Commission is too small and as an agency has too few funds to solve this larger public policy disaster when it comes to chemical management. But I personally remain committed to attempting to position this agency to play as meaningful and effective a role as we can to bring some clarity to consumers to the issue of toxic chemicals in the products that they use. I believe that the Federal Hazardous Substances Act gives us such authority. With respect to non-additive polymeric, I'm sorry, additive non-polymeric uh, OFRs in particular, in undertaking any rulemaking under this act, I believe we have the authority to address them as a class of chemicals. Further, I believe that in order to treat them as a hazardous substance under the act, we need only determine whether they, as a class, have the capacity to produce illness through ingestion, inhalation, or absorption through any bodily surface and may cause substantial illness as a result of customary or reasonably foreseeable handling or use of these products. In fact, down the road, should we need it, the FHSA also gives us the flexibility to create an exemption process. I believe the FHSA provides us with a very workable standard, and I look forward to seeing the results of the CHAP and finding a way forward and quickly. I want to echo the thanks to the petitioners for bringing this to our attention and also for our staff for their great work on it and going forward. I also much appreciated reviewing and hearing all of our commenters' submissions and testimony and thank them all for their tireless advocacy and willing to share their lifelong work with us as well as their personal stories. Addressing chronic hazards in consumer products is not an easy task, but is a necessary undertaking, including for this agency. We are never going to have perfect information. The essence of this body is to make reasoned judgments based on the best available information that we have at the time to protect the public. That is our mission. And with less than perfect information, but certainly enough at this juncture, we should always, always choose to protect children over protecting chemicals. Thank you, Commissioner Kay. Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Madam Chairman. First, I would like to uh, also compliment and thank the staff for all their hard work on this effort. It goes back for years in the, the, the last previous briefings uh, that were put together. Uh, your work and output, our general counsel today, who was certainly uh, put to the test and quite active with the procedural matters that were before us. Today, you have my compliments as well. Um, your uh, recommendations, your opinions, um, represent the highest level of professionalism and independence. Um, it was funny, it's something just was brought to my attention today that inexplicably the independence of our, of our staff's opinions and recommendations were brought into question by a major publication today and suggested that uh, you're subject to political pressure from all, from all places, the Trump White House. So yeah, as, uh, as for anybody that is knowledgeable about CPSC and understands uh, the, the kind of 
uh, professional and technical independence that our staff demonstrates to suggest that the Trump White House is pulling the strings among career staff is absolutely ludicrous. Um, I also want to thank uh, I also want to thank the special assistants today who um, had a tremendous amount of work in, um, in in making sure we got it right procedurally through all the uh, motions and especially of course uh, Commissioner Adler's special assistants um, for their tireless work and transparency um, and in giving all the commissioners uh, staffs and myself as much advance notice and time to think collaborate uh, on uh, on the matters that we had before us today. Uh, I also want to thank the uh, all the collective stakeholders that contributed uh, to this effort, and I know who will cont contribute, uh, continue to contribute to this effort in particular, um, and all of the stakeholders. I know we have some of the, uh, the health advocacy stakeholders in the room today, and Rachel in particular. Uh, Eve, I don't think he was here today also, um, but industry as well. I think everybody provided um, excellent testimony based on fact, um, it was uh, rhetorically free, I think, at least in my opinion, based on science, uh, giving us actionable information to take into consideration. And you have uh, my, my compliments for conducting uh, your, your, yourselves in that way in terms of the way you chose to um, influence the, the proceedings before us. So thank you all. And, uh, and of course, that extends to all stakeholders, including industry, for um, uh, for the way that the, that they have contributed to this uh, matter before the agency, uh, Chairman Burkle, I apologize for being a pest the last few days on this matter. You have a, a tremendous uh, so many things before you, and uh, and I think I've uh, I've crossed that line. I also want to uh, thank Commissioner K, uh, which to who today not only for always keeping a door open and always be willing to discuss issues. Um, uh, we disagree on the proper way forward today, but you'll always have my admiration for um, not just in words, but in your actions, your priority of decorum of this, of this body itself has always demonstrated itself in your own actions, and you've also helped me collegially in that way. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, the, your, your desire to see us treat each other with professional respect is, is admirable, and thank you for that. I think it's kind of akin to you know, judicial temperament, right? Um, you know, some have it and some don't. And uh, if you're ever in a position to be weighed and measured along those lines, you know, you're going to find yourself uh, not wanting in that regard. So thank you. And thank you for helping me uh, keep along with those same mores that I share uh, with you as well. Um, Commissioner Adler, you're a statesman and a gentleman. I can't thank you enough for the compliments. Uh, your passion for this issue and for all issues before consumers is recognized by, uh, by all, and uh, thank you for your leadership in this, uh, in this particular matter. Uh, I, I can't conclude without sharing some regrets. I think my greatest regret in this matter before us today is just um, a conclusion that I, I think that consensus and the desire for bipartisanship as as an end, just in and of itself, is at, is at an all-time low. I, I think that, you know, we're uh, throughout Washington and, and maybe in, in agencies and independent agencies like ours, um, we're, we're counting votes and uh, partisan power politics. It's just, I think it's a shame that, um, that the, the desire to reach consensus among the body, as opposed to just the, the, the pure outcome, is at such an all-time low. Um, I'll continue to work hard to strive towards it. I know my uh, colleagues will, Commissioner Adler. I know you'll continue to do that as well. Uh, but I think that's uh, uh, not seeing the not seeing the results of this uh, hearing before this decisional before us today go the way I would have desired. I think that's probably my greatest regret is to see that uh, bipartisanship and consensus uh, as an end, as a desirable stated goal uh, that um, somebody's preferences, maybe incremental preferences, might be put aside for the desire to seek, seek consensus is at such an all-time low. Uh, but we'll continue to try to move forward in another direction. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Adler. Thank you, Chairman Burkle. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes uh, the closing remarks from uh, uh, the dais. Uh, again, before closing, the 
public meeting today. I want to say thank you to our staff. Thank you to Dr. Thaler, Dr. Hadlett, and Ms. Pollitzer, and Dr. Borlase for being here, sitting through this entire proceeding. Also to Office of the Secretary for all of your work today, and Office of General Counsel, Executive Director, uh, and to OCM. I understand John McGugan's out, but uh, someone from OCM has managed with the audio visuals today, so we appreciate their efforts as well. Um, this concludes uh, the public meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Thank you all very much.